Tina Nicholson, and this is my town hall. And I wanted to uh, start by just welcoming everyone, of course, and letting you know that we just started into our new legislative session. And it's very important to me that I get out in the community and meet people, find out what they care about, and how they want me to represent them, because, after all, I work for you. And so I like to spend my weekends uh, during the session staying in touch with uh, the people that I work for uh, in my district and um, letting you know how to get a hold of me, letting you know what I'm working on, but also hearing from you about whatever you think I need to be doing that I may not work on if I wasn't connected to you. So uh, that's the purpose of these town halls. I like them to be very informal so people feel very comfortable just to um, let me know what they're thinking and uh, just we can have a good visit while we're together. The most important thing that I believe we need to continue to work on is strengthening the economy and getting people back to work in good paying jobs so they can be self-sufficient and support their families. And so a lot of the work that not only myself but the other people in the legislature on both sides of the aisle have been working on is to try to strengthen our economy and get people back to work. This year, Senate Bill 1 is our top priority bill and it's a bill to make colleges more affordable in Colorado. Right now, we know that colleges are just very, very expensive uh, for our um, younger population or somebody, uh, I think an older adult going back to school. Um, and there are some handouts. If you didn't get them, please uh, feel free or um, we can pass them around because there are not very many of us. And unfortunately, I think there are stickers that are there. Yeah. Um, but there are, but they, um, there's several sheets to each uh, section. Um, but when you, when you get the handout, you'll see um, that our top priority is what we call Senate Bill 1, which is called the College Affordability Act. And the problem is that college tuition and fees have gone up more than 600 percent since 1985. More than gas, medical, or energy inflation, nearly six times greater than the increase in general inflation during that same time. In 2000, the student share of tuition was 28 percent. In 2014. The student's share of tuition is 65. College textbooks have gone up 812% since 1978, more than three times the consumer price index during that same period. And yet, wages are not going up to keep up with the ability to pay those uh, higher prices for um, college education. So, what we in the Senate are proposing to do is to pass legislation that would add over $100 million to reinvest in our higher education institutions in Colorado. And we're talking about community colleges as well as universities like the University of Colorado and CU. And also to provide more money for um, need-based and merit-based uh, tuition uh, uh, scholarships so that if we have a student who's very talented, couldn't afford to go to school otherwise, um, some of this money will also help those students. Um, or a student who just has a tremendous need and should be going to school but won't be able to anymore. And we're also going to restore a 6% cap on tuition rate increases so that the, the colleges can't continue to make those tuition rates go up higher and higher and higher uh, to make it more and more unaffordable for not just the limited income families but for middle class families to go to school. We also know that in addition to how expensive it is, most of the graduates are carrying these enormous debt loads for years and years and years afterwards because they borrow in order to go to school. 
and sometimes it takes them years to pay it off. In fact, my son, who just uh, was graduated from uh, law school, has a hundred thousand dollar debt uh, that it will take him quite some time to pay that off. Um, and we think that that's very closely directly and directly related to the economy because we know that if we don't have a well-educated workforce, we don't have um, the opportunity for our economy to improve in this state. And we are not giving every individual an opportunity um, to reach their potential by being able to go to school. The, the good news is that the economy is getting better, but it is still not there. There are still people who are unemployed. And when people are getting back to work, they are not necessarily getting back to work in jobs that uh, allow them to actually support their families. The other piece of legislation that I'm personally carrying that is connected to the economy is called the Child Care Affordability Act, and it is an act to provide child care financial assistance to parents who have very young children who need to be in child care while the parents are working. And um, right now, the way uh, we have structured that program, if you get a raise or a promotion, you can um, immediately go over the threshold of eligibility and no longer be able to um, be eligible for that support. And you need to remove your child from that child care center because you can't afford to pay the full fee. Um, maybe find a babysitter that might not be as well qualified to take care of your child. Or quit your job or not accept the raise. And we want people to continue to um, move upward in their positions and become more and more self-sufficient because that's good for all of us and certainly good for that individual and their family. So in, we've been putting this barrier in the way of them being able to um, continue to improve in their work and their income to a point where they will no longer need assistance. We can force them back into a position where they need even more assistance. And it's called the cliff effect. And this particular legislation will remove the cliff effect and allow them to continue to keep their child in a child care facility even if they have gone beyond the threshold of the eligibility just by a little bit, um, but uh, also require that they continue to contribute more of the fair share to pay for the cost as their income <coughs> It's gradual rather than a cliff effect like we've had in the past. Um, then the other work that we've been do doing in the legislature has a lot to do with the wildfire, uh, catastrophic wildfires that we've experienced here in Colorado, and most recently, the catastrophic floods that we've experienced at and Evergreen uh, certainly being a part of uh, the flood damage. And I served uh, on the flood committee and continue to serve on that committee. We just got permission to have two more meetings in the legislature. There are 10 of us from the legislature, of 100 of us, who serve on this committee. And the purpose of this, um, to serve on the flood committee was to learn uh, the nature and extent of the flood damage, um, to learn about what resources were available to help people to recover from the damage of the floods, and also where were the gaps, and where could we help people with legislation that we could carry to make sure that people could get back on their feet after the flood. So let me give you an example of some legislation that I'm hearing about the flood uh, recovery effort. In the past, if you lost your property to a catastrophic natural event, like a flood or a fire, you still had to pay the property taxes on that property even after you lost your home for the end of that year. And the legislation that I'm uh, carrying in the Senate says that you won't. That you will just simply 
in this particular case, get a bill that's adjusted for the taxes um, that you would have owed from January until the event occurred in September, but you won't get a bill. Uh, so it's not like you get a rebate, you have to pay it, and then the government pays you back. You just will never be charged. Um, which I really liked because I think anyone who's lost their home already has a lot of trouble and are um, having a tough time getting back on their feet. And for the government to, to make it any more complicated uh, than their lives are right now. Is this um, just for floods or it's for any or? It's for any natural disaster where the governor has declared it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that would be true for wildfires as well or uh, a tornado, um, any event that might occur in Colorado. Uh, so that legislation is going through um, the legislature right now to help, help flood victims. Then the people who have had partial damage to their property can go through an appeal process unless the assessor has already figured out that there has been significant damage to their home. And in that case, the assessor will have adjusted uh, for that particular damage on their property so that the next year they've um, uh, had their, uh, quote, property tax bill adjusted to accommodate for the fact that they lost their home or that they partially lost their home, like they lost their decks, for example, off of their home because of the, uh, the flood or a bridge, something like that, that was part of their property. Um, and then I chaired the Wildfire Matters Review Committee, which was made, it's a bipartisan committee, just like the Flood Committee. And we are carrying uh, a package of bills to try to um, respond to catastrophic wildfires in the wildland urban interface, but also to motivate people to mitigate um, on their own property to reduce the risk of a wildfire um, damaging their homes uh, or their outbuildings and, God forbid, um, losing their lives. And last year, in the 2013 session, I carried some legislation that was signed by the governor that um, has provided the Department of Natural Resources in Colorado with millions of dollars that communities can apply for through a grant-making process to do mitigation on their own individual private properties. And it's also um, um, acceptable for homeowners associations to apply state uh, properties uh, like uh, Stanton Park. All those areas can have um, resources to do some of the mitigation because, as all of us know, this mitigation work is expensive uh, and it's certainly hard work. And it also requires quite a bit of knowledge. So another piece of legislation that's going through the process right now that's just come out of uh, my committee that I chair in local government is to put uh, a web-based uh, information center together so that people can go to that web-based uh, center and learn about ways to mitigate and where the locations are for slash pile collections and um, um, resources that they might uh, not know about in terms of um, tax incentives and other ways that people um, can be motivated to do the work on their own private properties. I'm also carrying some legislation this year that would change the um, require or the incentive uh, from a deduction to an income tax credit for the money that you spend doing uh, mitigation work on your own property in order to make your property safer yeah, uh, and um, prevent those heavy fuel loads from causing more damage to your property. Is that for 2015 forward? Yes. And then the last, the, the deduction is for 2013 back and nothing for 2014, is that correct? Um, no, I think that we, last year, we changed the law for the deduction so the deduction is this year? It's, it's also this year. Actually, we moved it forward for five years. Um, we renewed it because we didn't know whether the credit legislation 
uh, that I'm carrying this year would pass. Okay. Uh, so that we would at least have one protection or the other. Okay. But obviously the tax credit on your income is much better. better. Yeah, exactly. And it's up to 50% uh, of $5,000 worth of property on uh, or work on your property. And it's for joint, and you can move it forward um, from one year to the next um, so that you can have, um, you can take that credit in the future if you can't take it all at once. But isn't that only, and I just want to clarify this because I was reading the bill and I didn't quite understand it. So if you don't have a tax credit of 2500 then right. you carry it through. But if you're, but if say if you spent ten thousand right. dollars and had a large, you, you yes. can't carry that through. It's just right. like you don't have right. enough income. Right. Okay. Um, and with that, I would like to open it up to all of you, uh, so that you can get a sense of, or you can let me know what's important to you, and, and you can react to some of the things that I've, I've been working on, and I can find out how that all sounds to you. Yes. Jean, one of your statements here on the <clears throat> legislative priorities, you indicated make college more more than a dream. How do you plan to go about that, or you mm -hmm. personally? Well, um, this year, we're getting some legislation in the Senate to pay to give the uh, uh, institutions of higher education, like the community colleges, CU, CSU, Fort Lewis, etc., a hundred million dollars more than they've had in the past to cover their costs and requiring a uh, cap on the tuition for the students so that a student's costs for going to college isn't borne primarily by the student, but that the state is actually <coughs> helping the student with those costs. Are these all citizens? Yes. All citizens living yes. here in Colorado? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. I see. And of course, you know, we also passed the asset bill, which allows uh, young people who were brought to this country when they were babies to go to uh, our institutions of higher learning and pay in-state tuition. Jeannie, it's, uh, college tuition fees are going up more than 600%. Why? Mm -hmm. I mean, some of us think it's because the government has made it. Colleges have figured out how to manipulate the government tax system. So I'm, I want to know, you know, where, why has the why has the college costs gone up so much? Of course, medic, you know, medical costs have gone up so much. And I hate to say it, there's a common denominator in both of them. The government's involved, and I'm not, I'm not a Tea Party person. But it concerns me when, you know, okay, you're going to put in another hundred million bucks. The uh, colleges aren't naive. They're going to step up and say, okay, we'll figure out how to spend it. I, do you people know where, why college costs are going up so much? I think that it's important um, to say it a little bit differently than you did. Um, we're not going to put a hundred million back. That would, or that would sound like it's on top of um, them continuing to have had money all this time. But actually what we're doing is backfilling because, because of Tabor and because of the economic downturn, we have had less dollars over time to fund higher education because there are some mandated programs that have to be funded. K through 12 is one of them and corrections uh, is another department that takes a lot of the money and a lot of the money goes to um, Medicaid coverage. And so there wasn't, because of the economic downturn and because of TAPER, there wasn't a lot of money left in the pie for higher education. So the slice of the pie for higher education got smaller and smaller and smaller over time. And that is the reason we think that that cost has gone up. The college textbooks is different than that. We think that is um, a questionable increase that we should be exploring further in terms of trying to understand 
why college textbooks have gone up exponentially, but we don't think that's related. We think that that's a, um, a market-based um, challenge that um, we need to address. We suspect that it has to do with why the professors choose certain textbooks and not others. And so there's kind of a, a monopoly in terms of what book you have to purchase for a class. Well, I appreciate what you said, but the qu a question I still come back to is it's not the 600% increase since 1985. Are you just talking about Colorado? Yes. Or nationwide? No. I mean, nationwide tuition and everything else has gone up. Mm -hmm. But I, I have not seen or heard any place where they've addressed whether it's uh, tenured professors, whether it's buildings, whether it's what it is that has driven that, that we're, we're, we're addressing the, the wound and not the cause, if you know what I'm saying. I, I think I understand. I think uh, maybe a good example is Wyoming. Um, Wyoming's tuition for their colleges, their state institutions has not gone up nearly as much, nearly as drastically as Colorado's has. And Wyoming doesn't have TAPER, um, but they do uh, have a much higher severance tax on minerals. And so they are funding their schools with that resource. Okay. One more, one last time on this. Okay. Why? <laughs> that tuition and fees going up 600%. And um, if you're saying it's TAPER? It's because the state has been unable to fund the public schools at the same level we did in the past. Okay. Hmm. I know I'm right, but why do you think it's caused that? Why do you think that's true? Um, it's because of Tabor, which was uh, a decision that the taxpayers in Colorado made in the early 1990s to um, limit the way the state spends its money. And so for that reason, and then combined with the economic downturn, we have a smaller amount of money um, in relationship to the need than we did in um, the 1980s. Jeannie, I, I am not an expert on education, nor you know, profess to be. But I am just curious, don't you think a lot of it is that every parent feels like their child has to have a college education now, and the colleges are being flooded with applicants to go to school, and there's just, it's a supply and demand thing. You've got all these children out there who need to go to college, and I never had children, but let me tell you, if I had had a child, I would tell them to be an electrician or a plumber because they would make a heck of a lot of money more time now than they would if they got a college degree. <laughs> but I just kind of wonder if there's a supply and demand issue. Everybody feels like their child needs to have a college degree, and I don't think that's true. Well, I actually don't think it's true either. Um, the community colleges, I think, are doing a good job of helping to educate kids for the trades, um, plumbers, electricians, mm -hmm. etc. But I think another source that we have not um, benefited nearly as much from as we should is the union um, mm -hmm. education programs. Mm -hmm. I was very surprised when I ran for office how amazing those training programs are. And I'm not sure that um, career counselors in high schools even know about those programs, let alone encourage students uh, to use uh, that benefit. Um, in my household, we always thought that if our sons learned a trade, um, uh, and my husband was an excavator, if they learned how to operate heavy equipment when they were growing up, it would be a way for them to pay for going to school if they wanted to, um, and that it couldn't possibly hurt to have both skills. Um, so I am uh, with you in terms of thinking not everybody needs to go to college, not everybody should go to college, not everybody wants to go to college. Um, and that we definitely need people with higher education beyond uh, high school in order to have the skills and the trades, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in a college setting. 
the union programs, just to, to let you know if you haven't heard about them, are very impressive in the sense that you uh, work with people who are experienced in the field during the day, and then you have classes at night, and they pay you for the work that you do during the day, um, and you don't pay um, for uh, tuition and uh, all the other expenses that you do in a community college program. And so it's, I think it's a great opportunity for a lot of our youth to acquire a skill beyond high school that is very marketable and like Barbara's pointing out, sometimes making more money than a lot of other people do who do have college education. So if it was just about money, uh, sometimes going to college is not the guarantee that, that, it, that it, um, people think that it is. I think your point's well taken about, you know, the, the trades. Uh, when I went to high school, we had a lot of uh, trade. You had shop, you had wood shop, you had yeah. machine shop. Uh, ladies had some... Home uh, ec? Well, home, home ec. ec. But, yeah, but I mean, other, other things to do. Uh, let me stay on the theme of, if, if I may, about education. Uh, right in Jefferson County, uh, we're looking at the grades 1 through 12. Uh, we have, what, approximately 80, 85,000 students in Jefferson County, 11,000 between teachers and administration. Was it 4,200 teachers and how many, almost 7,000 administrators? You're asking where the costs are going? Think about all that administrative cost. Now translate that to college as well. Look at the number of students we have versus the number of uh, teachers and staff, there's where your costs are going. We're overburdened with overhead. That's where your money's going. Not only in Jefferson County, but in colleges as well. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about the details. It sounds like you have more information about the, the actual numbers. I'd have to see their budgets uh, to know if I thought that they were um, mishandling the funds. I'm not and saying I'm mishandling. I'm saying we have an extraordinary amount of overhead mm -hmm. per student mm -hmm. than is needed. Would you agree with that? I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. I was going to I was going to say um, I have a, a child who is attending community college, and I'm experiencing that it is a that the, that it is an excellent. Mm -hmm. Educational institution, mm -hmm. and um, the program is good. The teachers are well qualified. There are good support services. Um, there's a you know there's a, a, a campus that works you know a, a reasonable campus. It's not Red Rocks. It's front. The campus to be Front Range, which is up in Adams County. Mm -hmm. uh, but point being, it is expensive, but there is a value there, mm -hmm. and. If you, so I'm not, into, I'm not into questioning the value or the cost, but I do think some relief on the, the ratio of what the, parents, what the parents or the students pay related to what is uh, public, for the public part of the funding is well worth taking another look at. And, so and I would also respond to what you said just to say, <coughs> A total. I think it's misleading to talk about a total number of employees. You have to. You, you, you know, I would categorically say there's nowhere near 11,000 administrators. In no, I didn't say that. Schools. I there said may be 11. There are. There are. You know, there are many. It takes many different kinds of employees and staff to run a school system. People doing all kinds of jobs, including electricians and plumbers, as well as teachers. All I'm suggesting is 7,200 staff is a certain exorbitant amount of per student. The cost, that's where your costs are. I, I, I can't argue on the specific figure, but I, I have had experience in Jefferson County Schools and uh, did not see that, that kind of Well, I'll tell you, I, if you go to a board meeting and you look at the budget, you'll see where the costs are going. And of course, I think that that's a very appropriate conversation for you to have with your Jefferson County School Board. I, all I'm suggesting to you is that same cost is going to our state higher education. That's all my point. Yeah. 
I can change the subject just a little bit, sure. we're extracting a lot of oil and gas from eastern Colorado, and how much of that money is coming to the state, and exactly, do you have a dollar figure on where it goes, please? I don't, but I'll be glad to get you one. The impression that some of us have is that it's not enough. I would um, agree with that, probably. And uh, those natural resources belong to us mm -hmm. um, as, as a state. And um, when they're gone, they're gone. Yep. And for that reason, um, there should be some payment to the people for extracting. It better be a lot. And um, that is one of the reasons we think Wyoming is doing better than we are in terms of how they support their schools. Mm -hmm. um, is because their um, severance taxes and the credits that they that the industry gets are very different than they are for our state. Um, and it's something that I am looking into, think that it's something that we need to pursue. It's not my area of expertise. Many of you know my background is in healthcare, and so I um, don't naturally come with a full background in understanding the energy industry, but it's something you need to get to sp up to speed on once you are in the legislature, no matter what your background is. And so I'm certainly uh, supportive of measures that I think are going to be offered this session um, to talk about that. We also know that there is a, a very different cost of living on the uh, in different parts of the state, and the maybe the taxes for the industry need to be adjusted differently uh, for when they're when minerals are extracted from the east slope versus the west slope. Um, so uh, I think we're going to learn more about that as well. The president of the Senate appointed me to the Energy Council and sent me off to a number of trainings this summer to learn more about energy issues. And so I went to visit the Bakken Formation in North Dakota and learn about that uh, oil and gas boom in that uh, state. And um, some of you, if you get my newsletters, might have seen my newsletter about that particular trip. And then I um, also was in the state of Washington and Washington, D.C., taking classes from the University of Idaho about the whole range of sources of energy, how we can integrate those, why it's important to integrate them, uh, and why we need, um, in my mind and other people's minds, to begin to phase out of fossil fuels and into more uses of renewable energy sources as we are able to. I don't think we can do it immediately, but I think we need to go in that direction. Yes. A question that which relates to mineral extraction. Um, what would you say is the current state of standards for fracking in the state? Mm -hmm. Is there, you know, where where have we gotten, and where do you see us going in terms of regulating and keeping safety in that process, which is such an important part of mineral extraction? I think we need more regulation. I think that. A lot of the, ener um, the energy industry uh, who are um, taking natural gas um, out, of the, out of the earth are for that. Um, they just want it to be logical, reasonable regulations, and that's what I support as well. I think there's a lot of myths about fracking uh, that we need to dispel. <coughs> Um, and I think we need to understand that industry a lot better than the general public does right now. Um, my understanding is that there are some serious problems with fracking. For example, there, are, there is scientific evidence that connects the fracking process with earthquakes. And so it seems to me if that indeed is the case, we have scientific evidence of that, then we need to know where there's seismic activity and not frack in those areas um, so that we don't create a problem. But that's, you know, to me a very practical approach to it rather than saying we shouldn't frack at all. I think that we need to understand where, where does the science tell us 
it's reasonable to uh, frack, where is it not? Um, I also think that, um, and maybe some of you have a good science background in this room too, we use, when we use natural gas, uh, we're emitting less carbons into the air than we do with, with coal and with um, uh, um, shale oil. And for that reason, it's a good transition fuel for us to use as we're changing the way we um, use energy in the future. So I'm not totally anti-natural gas or fracking, but I think it has to be done under regulation so that it's done safely and it protects the environment at the same time we can use that fuel as we transition into um, less fossil fuels. Does the state have staff, uh, uh, adequate number of staff to monitor, monitor and, and supervise and, and study? No. no, I do not think they do. And I think that it would be more appropriate for us to um, develop some policies where we say, if there are 10 um, natural gas wells and three of them are very active and seven of them really aren't very active at all, then we need enough inspectors to go frequently to these three that are very active and fewer investigators over here to go, you know, make sure that things are going correctly with the seven that are less active. And I think we need to really refine the whole process of the way we do um, the tracking to make sure that the industry is uh, extracting this particular um, energy source uh, safely and correctly. Um, I think we also have to protect the water uh, supply. And um, if you do fracking in a way that you keep reusing the water to frack the next well, which some of the industry does, you are using, first of all, less water, and you're controlling where those chemicals are in a much better way. And of course, it makes much more sense that they are now revealing what those chemicals are. That's in place there? That's now required? It's required for them to say what the chemicals are. It is not required for them to tell you the recipe. And because of my female background, maybe, I call it a recipe. Which is, they, they, you know, if you were baking bread, you could say, well, you need some flour, and you need some water, and you need some oil, um, and you need some salt. But I wouldn't have to tell you how much of those ingredients. Mm -hmm. That's the recipe. So they don't have to say that. That apparently is still proprietary. And that's questionable. And that's questionable. And I, oh, uh, let me just add to that that I think there's one exception, and I strongly support that, and that is that if someone is exposed to those chemicals and we think that there's been some harm to their health, then the industry has to reveal to the physicians what those chemicals were. And before, they did not have to do that. Two quick questions. When does the legislative session start? And are these six items your items, or is this a legislative agenda, or is this just... Good items? questions, good questions. Um, the legislature has already started meeting. The session started on uh, the second Wednesday in January, and we end the 7th of May, so about four months. We're in session, 120 days. And the College Affordability Act is something that I will support I will sponsor and support, but I'm not the prime sponsor. Um, and the Child Care Assistance Program bill that I told you about, I'm a prime sponsor. Um, and several of the uh, wildfire legislation, pieces of legislation, I'm the prime sponsor. I guess what I'm trying to say, though, is <clears throat> this isn't all the legislation will address. OK. No, these are, these are some priorities. Okay. Yeah, there could be as many as 600 bills um, that we need I'll to keep track. Yeah, that keeps us busy. That's right. Yes. Will you address a little bit, because I don't want to read this and not listen to you, 
um, about the internet, high speed internet? Yes, mm -hmm. I'm glad you asked about that. One of the um, concerns that I have is that there is not high speed uh, internet access across Colorado. There are some unserved areas, including, for example, Conifer in this area. There are several pockets of unserved areas in Colorado, uh, where I live as well, in Golden Gate Canyon. And um, with enough resources, we can provide high-speed internet services throughout Colorado and connect to Colorado um, in terms of how we communicate through the internet. And because it is so uh, important to small businesses now to be able to use the internet, and because we know we can use it, uh, the internet for telehealth, um, to benefit people uh, in their homes. Uh, for example, we can uh, track whether your pacemaker is working um, using the internet now without having a uh, 95-year-old grandma have to be um, taken out of her home and hauled down to the cardiologist in Denver if that's a long um, trip for her um, just to see if her pacemaker is still working. We can do some pretty amazing things with telehealth. And in addition to that, uh, children doing their homework um, rely now more on the internet service. Um, so there are a lot of good reasons, safety reasons for us mm -hmm. uh, to have a whole system that connects the entire state. And uh, some of you might remember when uh, rural electrification, uh, we were taught about the history of rural electrification extending all over the country years and years ago. Um, and it was called a social compact to say no matter where you live, you're going to be able to have electricity to your farm or your ranch or your home. Mm -hmm. And we uh, more recently said, we really should have phone service for everybody. Everybody should have a single party dial tone, not have party lines. And uh, so we said, all right, that's a social compact. So we're going to put together a fund, and it's called the High Cost Fund. And this fund allows us to take money that the state collects from all of us here in this room if we have a landline or a cell phone. It's a tax on our phone, 2.6% of the basic service, not caller ID or any uh, special features that you have on your phone but the basic service is 2.6% of that. And it goes into this fund called the High Cost Fund, and it pays to subsidize the cost for a company that wants to provide phone service in an area where there aren't very many customers. And they couldn't afford to do it without that subsidy. The business couldn't do it. And so uh, for years, we've had this program to make sure that everybody had single party dial tone. Well, some of those companies are still getting millions of dollars in subsidy for parts of Colorado that are highly populated now, like Parker, Colorado. The Parker, Colorado has enough people that they don't need <laughs> the company, the private company doesn't need some assistance in um, making sure that they can cover the cost there. So we're saying, let's take the money that's no longer needed for that purpose and repurpose it and mm -hmm. create a new purpose for those funds. And that new purpose would be to provide high-speed internet services throughout Colorado. And we're talking about, when we talk about high-speed internet services, we're talking about four down, one up, megabits. And so we're saying if you have less than that, and I don't, I'm not a high-tech person, what my sons, who are high-tech people, say it means is that, Mom, because you don't live someplace where you have that, because I'm in one of those unserved areas, you have, if your service is slow, that's what it means, if you don't have that. And so I have slow. Um, people that are in unserved areas have slow. And it would be helpful if we had fast everywhere. And so this would allow us to have at least that. And you can certainly have more than that, or faster than that. But this would be the floor. And we would say to a private company, 
here's some money to go into this area that doesn't have that service right now and provide that service for the citizens who live in that area. So this is a bill that you're proposing. This bill, is, that's a bill that I'm proposing. And that happens to be, you're asking if this is my bill or somebody else's, that, that this happens to be my bill. Okay. Uh -huh. Prime sponsor of this particular bill. Are you taking that tax from the areas like Parker that don't need anymore and just transferring it yes. out to the other areas? Yes. You're not suggesting an additional new tax? No. No new tax. Transfer. No new tax. The amount of money stays at the ceiling of where it is. It's just simply saying, we don't need it here. Let's put it here. And one of the things that I would not want to do is burden a very limited income family with a tax that was really hard for them to pay. But um, it, it explains in this sheet, uh, and hopefully all of you have the details, on the first page that for very limited incomes who have a basic phone service, when we calculated it, it was 21 cents a month. So we're not talking about uh, a big burden on limited families, income families, and it's not much more than that for the rest of us. But it's something everybody's already paying. It's some, something that we're all paying right now, won't go up, it's just we're going to take that pot of money and move it if the legislature uh, agrees with me. Is there anything you can do on cell phone service? It's the same thing. We think that if we have these cell towers, if we have these towers for broadband services, and in a lot of these unserved areas, that's why there's not service, is because it's just too impractical to lay the lines in the ground, and you actually have to have towers to make it work in those areas. So this particular legislation is technology neutral, meaning whichever way you can provide that uh, for down one up is okay, as long as you're a reputable company. Uh, that can demonstrate to the taxpayers that we can trust you to do the work and not just be a fly-by-night in place and take the money and put up half a tower and leave. Mm -hmm. uh, you gotta, you know, you've got to be accountable. And we're, there's language in the bill that says, here's how we're going to hold you accountable. You know, it's going to be, the work is going to be bonded and uh, we'll have a clawback provision that says, you pay us back if you don't do this work. You know, if you take the money and you don't do the work, you give the taxpayers back to work, we'll give it to somebody we can trust, and they'll do the work. Um, and so our vision about the cell, cell phone um, towers is that in a lot of these areas, it's because it's topographically challenged, as well as challenged by the density. You don't have enough customers, and you got a lot of mountains and canyons, and you don't have line of sight, and uh, you got a lot of granite to go through if you try to put it in the ground, those kind of things. So we think that as we are able to incentivize these companies to put up these towers to provide the service in all these areas that are unserved right now, they can also put up the equipment to also um, access cell phones. So, um, and we think that's a major safety issue for everyone in the state, because it's not just where you live, it's where you happen to travel if you want to go fishing or backpacking or hunting or whatever, you know, you're not necessarily in the city for those activities. You know, you're up in the areas where there isn't um, um, ready, ready access to cell phone service. And if you have an injury or uh, something else happens, a heart attack, whatever, uh, it's really pretty nice if you can get some help right away. Mm -hmm. right. Jeannie, can I take you back to the issue on the wildfires um, legislation? I am wondering if you are aware of any legislation that's being proposed that contains any kind of verbiage about some proposed additional taxes to people who live in high fire dangers. Say, if you have a zip code of like 80439, you're going to have to pay an extra tax on your state taxes. Are they proposing some things like that? <coughs> Every legislator has the right to offer any legislation he or she wants to. So it's possible that someone will so offer some legislation like that, but it didn't come out of my committee. Okay. Um, my committee agreed that we wanted to provide incentives for people to do the mitigation work. We didn't want to provide penalties okay. to do it, because we think that that works better 
in the long run, that we're all on a learning curve. You know, a lot of people moved up from the city. They thought they weren't going to have to do any yard work. Um, they thought that they, um, yeah, now we, now we have more. Um, and you just traded off your lawnmower for, you know, for your chainsaw. chainsaw. And a lot of people didn't even know how to operate chainsaws. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are just on this learning curve trying to figure out, what, what? I thought I was going to come up here and just enjoy the mountains and go skiing. What happened? I have all this work to do and I don't know how to operate a chainsaw, etc. So um, my feeling is we take them on a learning curve, and including myself. And we all learn the things that we need to do to live in the wildland, urban interface, and hopefully we all do them. If people don't do them, I think to begin with, the insurance companies have a major role to say, we just can't insure you if you're not going to do this work because you're putting our asset um, in, in, you know, in, at risk. Mm -hmm. um, um, and the mortgage companies, I think, are going to weigh in. So I think the private industry has a role to play in terms of um, um, trying to motivate people, too. And I know that some of the insurance companies are actually dropping people. Uh, some of the insurance companies are refusing to uh, provide any insurance in the wildland or urban interface. But those are tend to be, we're watching that trend, they tend to be the much smaller insurance mm -hmm. companies. The big insurance companies, State Farm, American Family, are still here in Colorado, still willing to insure properties in the wildland urban interface, but they are now going onto the properties. If you have a good agent, in my opinion, he or she goes onto your property and says, hey, you've done some great work here, you've built your house out of the right materials, you're cleaning your gutters, you know, those kind of things, uh, of course we're happy to insure you. Um, you are a reasonable risk. There are no guarantees. Um, and, you know, your uh, insurance agent could come on your property and say, I think you've got a 10-foot defensible space here, but you probably need a 30-foot defensible space, or whatever, depending on the uniqueness of your own property. And along with that, I think it's important for not to go in and say, everybody in this area needs to get taxed once in a while. Because yeah. like you say, like where I live, um, our insurance company is thrilled with us where we live. We kind of bought up here with that in mind, too, not wanting to be in all the trees and stuff. And so I think it's important to let the insurance companies deal with this because, you know, then you're paying a lot more or whatever. Um, or if, like, we got such a high rating because of the way we take care of our property. Mm -hmm. And so I think well, it's important you. not to just come in and blanketly say everybody in this zone has to be taxed up the design. I absolutely agree with that. I, it's it's not only the work you did on your own property, but it's, it's the unique topography of yes. your property. Definitely. It's the environment around your property. There are so many variables mm -hmm. that I don't think that would I don't think it would even be. I thought I heard them talking about it last they fall. They clearly were talking about it. Oh yes, and they came and reported. And doesn't California do something like that? I don't. I can't remember if California does, but they came and reported to our wildfire committee yeah, okay. about, and it was the governor's task force. Okay. That yes. wanted to do that. Okay. And we said no. Okay. We said no. We we're going to do some incentives, um, and. Uh, provide people with money, provide people with tax deductions, maybe tax credits, um, education, uh, a variety of other strategies that we think will work. If they don't, we may have to think of something more drastic, but I think over time mm -hmm. we're going to get better and better. You know who I worry about the most are the private landowners that don't live here. That live out of state, mm -hmm. and and they're not, and they don't have a structure on on their land. Mm -hmm. What's their motivation? Mm -hmm. And what if they are, maybe they have good hearts and or you know and care about forest health and they'll do it anyway. But what if they're below a major subdivision and the fire goes up into that major um, subdivision because they had that huge fuel load on there? 40 acre parcel, and it was really just an investment parcel. I'm making this story up, you know, no, but, but I think there are other yeah. pieces yeah. like that, yeah. that it's they're valid. just vacant land. That's the only piece that I'm worried about. Mm -hmm. So um, I may at some point carry some legislation to say that 
And this is something we considered during the uh, um, several meetings that we had during the summer um, that I chaired was um, re allowing a county to go in and do the mitigation work on someone's property and charging them when they refused and they had adequate, reasonable time to have done the work. Mm -hmm. This guy and I live on a piece of property where there is some properties next to us and behind us and it's vacant and the person who owns it lives down in Denver and I don't think he yeah. really does a whole lot. And it's been kind of a concern to us. Sure. We mitigate ours, but he doesn't do anything with his, so if it his goes up in flames, we're at risk. Yeah, you are. Right. You're more at risk. And we than have no control it. over what he does. Yeah. Is that mitigation and defense of the space around mm -hmm. this vacant block? Is that what you're talking about? Well, good mitigation work means that you've uh, defended the area around your oh, structures, um, like a 30-foot um, yeah. defensible space. And then good mitigation means you go out mm -hmm. another 100 feet and fence some, but not as much as you did in that first section and then you keep going out. My husband calls it going out in circles, mm -hmm. you know, where you continue to keep going out. And you're, you're doing that um, for a, a lot of reasons. One, to protect your own structures and the value of your own land and your life, but also your neighbors. And because it's good for the forest. It's for the, it's a lot. My husband does it because he believes in forest health. So back to the empty lot. The big, like say three, four, five acres, whatever. Would you then, if it's got nothing, make sure the defense will, is just around the periphery, and the middle can blow up or whatever, but it's not going to be going out. Well, I don't. I'm not trying to be. Yeah. That. I'm just trying. To no, I know. I'm, I, and I'm, I really don't know. I mean, I think you need a state forester to say on mm -hmm. this particular piece of property, mm -hmm. this is how you would do it. Uh -huh. um, I really depend on those guys. They are the pros at saying. You know, because of the, the slope of the land and uh, the uh, natural wind directions and all of those variables that they take into account, this is the kind of mitigation work we should do on this property. And it's also timing. I mean, the, we're learning too that if you thin too quickly, you can get into trouble because the lodgepole pine trees don't have really strong root systems. Um, and so you have to thin over time so that those lodgepole pines that were used to sort of their buddies around them, buffering a little bit of the wind, it gets stronger. And so what we found is if you clear it all out at once, you can have these blowdowns with gusts. So we're it as you know. My point is that I think we're just all in this huge learning curve, learning how this works and what we need to do. Jamie, would you name the committee that you chair? It's called the wild. It's a long name. Wild. Fire Matters Review Committee. And and the Senate committees. What was the Senate committee that you chair? I chair local government. And which ones do you serve on? I serve on Health and Human Services. And that's just those two. When I started, I served on five committees. Now I actually serve on um, those two that are familiar to most people, and then Ledge Council, a third one. Yeah. Um, and I'm the caucus chair. And so I'm in a leadership role in the Senate at this point. That keeps you busy. Um, so, there, so I have some additional responsibilities with that, and that's why I'm on fewer committees right. than I was to begin with. I think it was a freshman training thing, too. That <laughs> <John always committees. laughs> so if we have, like, we're, we're all part of a neighborhood up in Echo Hills, and we're working on our wildfire mitigation oh, that's great. thing. <laughs> that's great. That's great. But like one of the things that we're running into is like we have 500 acres adjacent to us that's owned by Denver Mountain Parks, and they're they don't have budget to do they what don't want to play. they oh. need to do and won't allow us to do it because of liability. Yeah. And then yes. you've got U.S. Forest Service land and they don't have budget at the end. And so not only do we have our own mitigation and people who have lots that don't have houses that we have to worry about, but you've so got Denver Mountain Park. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that we're trying to do is there was a fire road. That, that, that is no longer maintained. Early so 1990s, one of the things that we wanted to do is apply for a grant to maybe help them do the lane, you know, do the fix the road so we can get out. If the very, road very important. 
Yeah, so is this something like it that you would support, of course? And but that also, grant says it's not for road construction, but we're just talking about maintaining an already existing road. Okay. So, but I mean, how do you, how do you, I guess the question is, how do you suggest, because we've contacted them from Mountain Parks, Evergreen Fire, Clareford County, they're all in support of, gee, we'd love to do it, but there's no budget, or... Then the Mountain is, Parks should be applying for the money I was talking about on their own. Yes. Oh, good idea. Yeah. So and they can apply on their own. Of course. Oh, and then we can apply for something else. Yes. Yeah. I've tried it yet again. Yeah, and uh, if you give me more details, I will be right with you. Yes, or an you know, email, whatever is whatever yes. easy for you, or a phone call, um, then I can call them too and mm -hmm. say, okay. why don't you apply for this money? Because we are working on it right as we speak. So I'll send you an email. Is your, your email is in here somewhere. Yes. I'll send you that this week. Okay. Awesome. Susan Westbrook? Yes. Jeannie, yes. yes. um, a year or two years ago, they had that statewide did you know I did. Okay, thank uh, you. meetings for TBD to be determined. Yes. And uh, the governor's meetings. Somebody says it's taxed by Democrats, but I'm not saying <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, To be determined. <laughs> <laughs> are, are there any initiatives coming out of that that you see showing up in this legislative session? Not that I know of specifically. Okay. Uh, that are tied to that um, okay. effort. I think that what the governor heard when he went around the state and had those meetings was that um, businesses were struggling and they wanted the government, uh, the state government, to tighten our belts, mm -hmm. make sure we were streamlining um, our efforts, and that um, we should work to find things that created obstacles for small businesses to do well and remove those obstacles whenever practical. Okay. Um, and those were kind of the major themes that I think came out of that. And so I think there would be, it would be fair to say there's probably several pieces of legislation over the last few years that have had to do with streamlining. Um, for example, a bill that I'm carrying this year um, combines two commissions because they were essentially doing the same work and you know combining it into just one and um, um, it also allows the governor to declare a disaster in a county when the presidential disaster declaration doesn't include a county because during the flood we found that people who live right on the county borders if they were in one county they weren't eligible for FEMA benefits if, even if they had the same damage to their property as the people who lived right next to them in another <coughs> county. And it would, <coughs> you know, that's not fair. So we needed to fix that. Anything else? Yeah, let's go back to the job. <coughs> to the jobs? The job. Okay. Yeah, I wanna, I'm, I'm curious as to what the plan is for creating good paying jobs in our state? Well, um, as I commented earlier, we are actually doing better than most states. I hear that from most politicians. Oh, I well, want to know what we can do okay. to be even more better. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. Um, last year, I carried some legislation called Keep Jobs in Colorado. And so moving forward into the future, which I think is your point, is that um, if a contractor has a contract to do any work in the state, the, um, he has to hire Colorado residents. The only way that he can hire someone from outside of Colorado to do the work um, is if there aren't people in the state who have the expertise, the skills to do a particular job for that project. So that is an assurance that we've never had before moving forward, that if you're an electrician or a plumber or whatever, um, you're not competing with people that are coming from other states. These are for state jobs, though, right? These are for state right. jobs. Okay. Yeah, it's a little harder for us to impose those right. things right. on private right. 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 industry. Um, you know, we can't tell people 
in private industry what they can do. That's, you know, right. we believe in the free market, but yeah. No, you can't. Right, exactly. Um, when did that go into effect then? It went into effect as soon as the governor signed it, so about six months ago. But you won't see a lot of the impact uh, until we're doing the construction on state projects. And then you see it with who we, who we hire, so that they aren't bringing people in from other states. Or other countries. Or other countries, exactly. That's right, other countries as well. It was interesting to see how quickly CDOT took care of the roads like to see them be able to move forward with other projects as quickly as they did after the floods. That was pretty awesome. I know. That was amazing. Because, I mean, everything is so complicated and the bidding process is so difficult and right. everything is so long and we know it can be done faster. Right. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see some of that streamlined so that we could see that going forward. Okay. We'll look for those opportunities. And one, you've heard of Impact 64, of course which would have created an awful lot of jobs in, on our roads and highways and transit, but uh, it's been withdrawn, there's, there's no support Do you, for it. Does would everybody you like know who you are? Is? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Introduce yourself, Paul. Well, I'm, I'm Bruce Daly, I'm the RPD board director for this, this area. For the <laughs> transit is of, is of interest to me, and the, it was thought that you had no support. I wonder if you had any comments on that. You mean no support from the state legislature? No, no support from the public. Oh, from the public, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, well, I just think we missed the opportunity um, that we need that public transportation. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, well, not just for the transportation. That was an, that one element of it, but the right. major element was uh, infrastructure, roads and bridges, right. especially mm -hmm. in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't know if you had any comment. Was that a referendum that went to the people to vote on No, it never made it. It never made it. Oh, okay. Was, so it was coming out of the legislature and it just never made no, it? No, it, it was uh, promoted by the governor, of course, and CDOT. And then, you know, the private group, lots of chambers and those kind of things. But it never made it onto the ballot? No, it decided it didn't have. It. We did a poll. We. They did a poll. It, it wasn't wrong. signature so much as just that there wasn't enough, there wasn't enough, enough political will to, mm -hmm. to, um, to tax the people. I think the consultants advised them against it, and right. rightly so, unfortunately, it's the economy, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe it will mm -hmm. be short-sighted, mm -hmm. as things often are in the way we grow in Colorado, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it is kind of like the thing we can't do anything about this go around. Uh, I think it would Poorly struck because it, it competed, it put, it placed the rural counties against the cities a little bit because the city, rural counties would get very little of the transit taxes, mm -hmm. for transit, and the cities would get that mm -hmm. portion of it for transit. So I think it pitted the rural counties against the cities uh, yeah. the way it was made up, but I just wonder if that any thoughts on that. Well, I just think that there that? we have major infrastructure problems mm -hmm. that need to be responded. But did you drive up here today from the flatlands, or did you come from? I came across the top. Because I said you were in a testament today. To I, I, when I when I was coming eastbound on I seventy, I was grateful that I was going eastbound <laughs> to get to Evergreen from my house, yeah. rather, and thought. On my way home, it, I will be timing it correctly also. Mm. <laughs> the news this morning was so, showing the traffic at 7.30 El Rancho backed up. Well, that's that's exactly that was westbound. Insane. Yeah. That was yeah. westbound. Yeah. That's exactly what it was. It just looked like I looked over on the other side. It was just a parking lot. I wonder if eastbound will be Sunday. Yeah. Sunday will be bad eastbound. Eastbound mm -hmm. with, yeah, the third, Sunday with, bad with the third, third uh, Opening the tunnel. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The window. I just saw it. Yeah, they opened it. Yeah. Should be they make that a toll lane? I'm sorry? Is the third lane going to be made a toll lane? Huh? Oh, is that a no, toll lane? There's no, there's no toll, toll lane. Because it was built with taxpayers' money, so they can't make it a toll lane. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have them on I 25. Those uh, high occupancy, high occupancy. Yeah, those yeah. are high occupancy. Yeah, they're special mm -hmm. lanes. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I know that's not uh, a full answer to your question about creating jobs. No, I'm more interested in the private sector. I really don't think business 
business. I think businesses should be businesses. Yeah. And that's where our jobs are going to come from. And if the government's going to do anything, they should help the private sector develop more businesses. And I'm particularly involved in manufacturing since I've seen so much of our manufacturing right. go elsewhere. Right. And, um, I, but I don't see a lot happening to, to change that. How do, you, how do you think we could be more helpful? Uh, get out of the way. <laughs> and, can you, and can you give us some real specifics about how to get out of the way? Because I just want to, let me just back that up with telling you, my husband and I owned an excavation business. And I have, you know, personal experience because of owning our own business, a small business, um, that I know what it's like when the government imposes things that don't make a lot of sense, don't even help the government that much, and certainly create some burden uh, to small businesses. But if, if somebody doesn't give me specifics, it's hard for me to figure out how to be helpful. I'll work on that. Um, I, I own a small manufacturer. Okay. And we employ people in the county sure. Golden. Okay. <clears throat> and so we're always, because we're a private sector business, we look towards a better economy Mm -hmm. in order to improve our business. You, mm -hmm. you can manufacture the best products in the world, but if nobody you can afford to buy them, yeah. then, you know, we all work for sure. the customer, whether we like it or not, That's right. or appreciate that or not. And so when I look out over, over our country, not just our state, I'm seeing more and more division rather than consolidation. I, I, I believe our country is, is, is divided economically. I'm watching the stock market go through the roof. And we put out an ad for a QC person and we get 400 applications. Um, and a lot of these people are way overqualified for this position. And so that tells me that there's a problem. Um, and, and, I don't, and I think it's probably our number one problem in, in the state and in the country today. And I, and I, I see the government kind of well, let's talk about this, or let's work on this. Here. Insignificant, almost shallow. My wife and I have a joke. We say so shallow is mud, and I and I see a lot of that. We, you know, we're talking about these insignificant things that we're battling over when, when really, there's nothing like good jobs. I mean, I agree. You know, if you look at the Industrial Revolution, you look at World War II. We won World War II because we outproduced everybody else. And now if we wanted to have another war, we'd have to have our bullets made in China, and our enemies would have their bullets made in China. And now we're talking about a whole different story. And so to me, really what we need to be doing is focusing on U.S. manufacturing, which is where it all starts. You don't build something, you're not doing anything. Right. You're right. just trading somebody else's right. yeah, building. Product. Uh, and, and, and I'm kind of a political junkie, and I watch this closely, and, and I get really disappointed with our government. Our, you know, just because of the way they're arguing over what I consider to be relatively insignificant issues, mm -hmm. uh, and just to kind of keep us busy, like, like during the Roman Empire, when they were overtaxing the people, they increased the gladiators so that they could keep the people occupied so they weren't paying so much attention to the taxes they were paying. Are you referring to the Broncos game? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, reality TV. Although, although, <laughs> let, me, let me just say... Sometimes I see correlations. <laughs> let me just say, uh, I agree with you, and there's tremendous income inequality in the country. Um, well, there's well, income inequality is not a good term, okay. because that always implies taking money from one person and giving it to another. Oh, I'm and sorry. And that's not... No, that's around. not... I'm trying to get this guy a good job. I'm yeah. not trying to get him his money. You know? I agree. And I so agree. so that, that's not a good approach from my point of view. Okay. From well, let, let, me, let me say work. it. Let me just say it uh, another way then. Um, there are some people who are uh, not making uh, enough money to be self-sufficient. Um, and that... Um, we need to figure out ways to help everybody be self-sufficient. And um, we do, I agree, there are times when I'm in the Senate chamber when I think we're talking about a lot of stuff that's not very important to the people. 
and we're not solving the problems that really matter to them. So I'm with you. But I think you need to give me specifics about if you did this, if you passed a law that accomplished this and this, that would help these people to have good jobs so that they would be customers and be able to purchase so things. So mostly then what, what we talk about is passing a law. That's what governments do, I guess. They, they pass laws. And mostly they pass laws to redistribute money somehow. Really, to rescind some laws. But, well, not really to rescind some laws. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, probably that would be, be good. You know, like, this this is just a wild hair-brained idea, and I'm not suggesting that we go do this, but how many businesses do we have in Colorado? I don't know. Okay, let's say we have 25,000 businesses. So every business is incentivized to take a... Uh, an inner city kid and put them through school. That has nothing to do with the government. It has, you know, it, 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 it's saying, okay, let's rely on the people to, you know, we're Americans, we can do this. We don't need some government to tell us what to do and how to do it. And that's, what would the incentive be? I don't know, it's your job. If you wanted to have a product made out of a particular steel, I could offer you 40 suggestions. That's my job. Um, you know, I, I didn't want government to do pardon? this. I don't want. I want government to govern, to to figure out what's going to be the best thing for our country. You know, and it almost seems like government these days is a is a is an ouroboros. It's a snake eating its tail. It's, you know, we have to take this going and this going so we can get our salaries. And, and well, I, I know um, that doesn't speak very highly. And oh, no, that's okay. But um, let me just say, um, think about it uh, and, and, come, I will. and I come back, because uh, you have my card now and you know how to get a hold of me. Uh, think about it. And when you have some very specific things that you know would help to solve that problem, I'd be very interested in working on those. And this gentleman had to say. Well, I want to jump in a sli slightly different topic. Well, uh, but it has some relevance. I want to ask you about mental health services, mm -hmm. particularly mental health services in schools. Um, I think the uh, uh, that's a, a field that I worked in before prior to where my current job. I know that there's a structure in place, but I know it's chronically underfunded. Right. There and and it's and it's there, there's two things. There's proper funding, and there is creation of a climate where it's okay to get help for problems right. and you don't have to, you know, take extreme measures or become isolated or become outcast. Right. So what what is going on? What, what's the legislature doing with that issue? Well, let me start with a story. I used to be a school nurse in Gilpin County. One day I walked into the school, I was just up there to sign immunization records, and there was a kid, a 16-year-old boy, who was bouncing off the walls, literally and figuratively. And the kids in the hall were scared and trying to get out of his way, and the principal was screaming at him and telling him he was going to expel him from school. And I asked the principal if I could talk to the principal uh, about this kid. And I said, this kid's got some big challenges at home, and the last thing he needs is to be expelled from school. He is scared and he is angry. And he's 16 years old and he doesn't know how to walk into your office as a principal and say, I'm scared and I'm angry, could you give me some help? So he's bouncing off the walls to let you know he's scared and he's angry. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, without violating, um, without violating his confidentiality um, and telling you who this person is, I can tell you that his father had uh, had a severe stroke two years before and was unable to dress himself, was unable to feed himself, was unable to uh, take care of himself, couldn't speak anymore, and just sat in the living room uh, with the help of his mother taking care of um, his father um, and, you know, drool because that happens sometimes when you have a severe stroke and half your body is uh, paralyzed and 
this was a really hard thing for this 16-year-old boy who's developing his male identity to see. And in that week just prior to him losing it at school, his mother had just been diagnosed with a deadly form of cancer. Now this kid didn't need to be expelled from school. He would have been isolated, marginalized more, and who knows what could have happened with all this anger and, and uh, fear that he was feeling. Um, fortunately, the principal got it and we kept this kid in school. He graduated and you know we could create a support system for his family and the community. But from that day forward, I thought, I'm going to figure out how to get a mental health counselor in the school. Because the school psychologist has a different role in the, in the school. The academic counselor helps you get ready for career decisions. But there's really nobody who can work with these kids and then their families in a way that we need in our communities. We've got lots of kids that are struggling with similar kinds of challenges. And if we don't help them with some kind of resource that's reasonable, everything escalates for them and for the community and their families. It took me years to convince the little school where I was the school nurse that we needed to do this, just like you said, because it, it, exactly what you were describing, it took forever for them to say, we actually need this. Our kids need this. But in the last three years, we have someone in this school. Mm -hmm. And when we have been able to identify kids and uh, intervene uh, when they were um, uh, at risk of suicide, uh, when they were at risk of dropping out, um, to help them with bullying issues, a whole series of things. And I think that her very modest salary is more than made up for in all of the prevention work that she's been able to do in that school. So in my opinion, I think we need those in every school. And um, we're working on some legislation, trying to find the resources, but we also know, to your point, that we have to help the schools understand that um, they really need this resource and that it's not going to take away from something else that's more needed. It is so critical that they simply need it. And in my opinion, and I'd be interested in your opinion too because of your background and everyone else's for that matter, I don't think they should be hired by the principal. I don't even think they should work for the school. I think that they should work for the, for the mental health center because they need a unique kind of supervision that is different than a principal can provide for them when they're working with these families. How can you do this without creating a database that sticks with this child for the rest mm -hmm. of their life? They have to have, they have to abide with HIPAA laws. They have to have the same confidentiality protection as anybody would receive in any other setting. There is no, if there is a violation of that confidentiality, it's a violation of the law. That's all right. We've, you know, we've had, many Jefferson County schools have had mental health professionals in the schools. That's true. Uh, social workers who have been that role, counselors, but counselors, as you say, in a mental, in a mental health role. And there's a, and to the question this lady asked, there's, a, there's always been a great emphasis on confidentiality of records. You don't, the records are not readily available, they're not shared with people who don't need to know. They're not they don't shared with the principal. They don't follow the student outside of school, you know, beyond school. I mean, that, that's been a concern and been dealt with. And, uh, the, you know, so I think that would not be something that would stand in the way. But there's always, there, there are budgetary pressures you know, in schools, in schools there are, you know, many, many needs, and there are many, many really good things you can do with time and money, and so there's constant jockeying back and forth. You know, but that's why what's more important, the mental health counselor or the uh, librarian or the shop class? That's why or, the money doesn't come from the school or to the school, in my model. The money yeah, doesn't so even you, go there. So you fund it through the mental health a different channel. <clears throat> Yep. So it wouldn't be part of the school. 
not budget. part of the school budget. Mm -hmm. yeah. no. What was the resistance that you encountered? That you Our kids through? are fine. So it was closed mindedness. Mm -hmm. Our kids are fine. Stupid leaders. Mm -hmm. I think I think to be fair, they are so afraid that they're not going to have a certain image as a school that they will do things to ignore a problem that the kids are having and instead of dealing with it. Um, and school boards do that sometimes and principals do that because their image of their school has to be outstanding and they get lots of recognition for that. And sometimes you, uh, politicians, it's true too, you can get caught up in the image and not, not be doing what you really should be doing. Change the name. Don't call it a mental health counselor. Mm -hmm. I think that's key. I think it's really something key. else that would have a more positive. I can't think of something, but something that has a more positive spin, helping the kids meet the challenges of going, you know, whatever. But it could be that simple. I think just the actually, mental, mental, yeah, the mental health. Mental like, well, my, health. Kid, my child isn't crazy, or our students aren't crazy, or I mean, it might even be something that simple. Yeah, Boulder actually good. has a different title for their for their workers that go into the schools with that same kind of expertise. So it's a model that's in some... What do they call them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the name right now. I mean, it's I odd don't how that... But, it, but, it's, but it's a very unique name. I think it doesn't have any attachment to it. Could be good. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's a shortage of politically correct names that's that true. don't offend people. <laughs> um, it, you know, there seriously is. Yeah. I sure. mean, you could call them a resource person, except that's kind of been co-opted into security guards right. or sort of resource people. Right. right. Yes. And so, resource. you know, it's, it is difficult, but it's not. Not. But it's not insurmountable. So, yeah. yeah. May I suggest maybe we need to put nurses back in our schools yeah. and back in, in our communities? They're not. Do you know schools? how many students a nurse from Jefferson County has? I have no idea. A zillion. No, they're many. They're responsible many. for several schools. Yeah, they're responsible for several schools. And I really yeah. think that's key. I mean, we have so many registered nurses in the state of Colorado, many who can't find work. I think it would be key because nurses are truly trusted individuals. And we took them out of the schools. And I think they can be a neutral party, very objective, non judgmental, not hired by the school system. Right. And Boulder, they and I looking at our communities, you know, what do we have in Evergreen? What do we have in Boulder? Boulder? Who are the nurses in that community that can come together and say, how do we look at these this population and address the mind? You know, how do we address it? And how do we address it professionally, individually? We as nurses go into the homes. We go into the hospitals. We see these individuals everywhere. And I think it's really a, a key component that this country is missing. You know, when we, um, it, it saddens me here in Colorado to see the number of suicide completions amongst our children and amongst our adolescents. We are high. We are very high, not just on pot, but on, the, but on, you know, on suicide completion. And it is, it, it really makes you wonder. And when you look at the state of affairs in Colorado, of what's happening in our schools, it's the mental health workers may be there, but I'll tell you what, we we need we need to get on the forefront. I am in psychiatric facilities with our adolescents, bringing in my nursing students, and it is really it, it, it's a crime against our children that they're just not getting. I don't think they're getting the attention that they really need, and we can't leave it to the teachers. Who, the who's not giving them the attention? The parents? The children? No, no. Who, who is not giving the children? The attention, the parents. the parents. I think the parents. I think also the societal pressures in the school, the bullying that takes place. How extensive like, is that bullying? I think the bullying's pretty extensive. Well, I mean, I, I just, I mean, I, I know it's been a big issue yeah. with the, uh, but I've never really seen any statistics. And for a lot of kids, what I've seen in the schools is there's a lot of good schools that don't have bullying, and it stresses out the kids that they're being bullied. So I mean, is he a point? And I don't know what the numbers are. Yeah. Actually, there's a program called Safe to Tell. Mm -hmm. And we do have some statistics from yeah. Safe to Tell um, that uh, um, let us know not the extent 
because the program is just designed to confidentially allow a student to call a hotline and report something like a bullying event uh, to this to this um, hotline. Um, that doesn't mean that 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 everyone reports to it. Probably it's only the tip of the iceberg. But um, I just saw those statistics, and I'm sorry that the number doesn't stick with me, but I remember that it was pretty high for bullying, uh, the kids calling in. And I don't think that it was like one school. I think it was across the state. Um, and it's an underfunded program, and it's one of the priorities that we have this year is to uh, provide more funding for that, that program because we know that it's already successful. Oh, here we go. Thank you. A bullying, 2,296 calls. In, 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 in what Colorado? period of time? In, the, in Colorado. In Colorado. Oh. Child, correct. With like in, in a year. Nine students are in Nine Colorado. Years. Nine Between years. September 4 and October 13. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Received um, between September 2004 oh, and oh, October 2013. Safe to Tell received not quite 10,000, 9,256 reports from 163 colored towns and 59 counties. <coughs> so pretty much across. Um, and there are only 64 counties on this day. And the numbers by category were the following. Um, and bullying was right up at the top, 2,296. And uh, like I said, I think it's probably the tip of the iceberg and passed this all. Mm -hmm. Can I go back to College affordable. Hi, Casey. Um, let me just introduce Casey. Casey Ty just uh, joined us. Casey is a county commissioner for Jefferson County. How are you doing? Sorry, late, but doing this in Lakewood too, so all sorts of stuff. Oh, okay. Um, I'm just reading over this information on the college affordable, and I want to speak for those of for those who are not here. Okay. The youth and the college mm -hmm. students. I, reading through this, uh, uh, student debt level, let's see, student debt, debt level almost doubled in eight, eight years, so it went up 200%. In 10 years, tuition has tripled, so that went up 300%. Since 1978, which is 35 years ago, textbooks have gone up 812%. Uh, since 1985, in the last 29 years, the college tuition fees have gone up 600%. And the biggie is there's nearly $1 trillion in outstanding student debt in the U.S. It's more than the credit card debt in the U.S. So I go back to the question of not just throwing more money at this, but why has it gone up 600%? And as, as we give it more money, we may not mean it, but we are feeding that animal, we don't get for, the same care, same thing with medical costs. We don't get at the cause, and we have all these other things. And that's why I keep going back to, I think the legislators look at just not how to fix, how to give it more money, but what's the cause. Okay, I will look into that. And one last thing on that. What I feel is, is horrible is the $1 trillion. We are indenturing our college credit. I totally agree. I mean, and we're doing that, and with the insurance students coming up, I mean, I look back when I came out of college and I had zero debt. My kids came out of college with zero debt. And there's a saying, gold is the currency of kings, silver is the currency of the aristocrats, uh, fiat money is the currency of business, excuse me, and debt is the currency of slaves. Yeah. And that's what we're doing to our kids. Exactly. Yep, we do need to change it, absolutely. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. Can I um, raise an unpopular no. issue, Jeannie? Yes. Sure. I wanted to ask you, are there, are you aware of any um, bills out there now or some proposed bills to overturn the um, gun laws from last yeah. year? I know that's the elephant in the room here. Yes. And we just had another shooting this morning. Where? I didn't in know Maryland. Where? In a oh, mall Maryland. in Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland, three people dead. Yes. And this country, and you know, we had a shooting in December in Arapaho at the school. It just continues on and on. 
And how do you propose to solve that? I don't know. I, I, I grew up with a father who was a part-time police officer. There were guns in the house. I never, ever had any inclination to take a gun. So why, why would a law I don't know what's changed. What do you want to do? I don't know if that dovetails with the mental health issues. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It well, I know that people that go out and shoot other people for no reason are certainly crazy. But you could say that anyone with a collection of shoes is crazy. They're just in control. Right. The issue is is not crazy, but control. And and I watch this very closely. Uh, and you know, we 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 pay attention to to solutions you know and i know it, you know you could make sex against a law to stop aids but i don't think you're going to find people stopping and to make a law against something that people that don't obey the law are the problem then that doesn't make sense to me there has to be some other way to go about solving this problem then you know because why not just make crime against the law one law? It is. It is. Oh, it is. Oh, it is. <laughs> Let's stop it. Well, I rest my case. My understanding so, is homicides have gone down by 50% of it. So somehow the media... I don't believe that. Okay. I don't think South Chicago, I don't believe that. I think <laughs> no, I'm saying throughout the country, crime has gone down, homicides have gone down by 50%. I guess we could Google if somebody has a smartphone, they could ask it. No, no, you could just find some statistic. What I learned in college is statistics don't lie, but statisticians lie like hell. No, it's, <laughs> lies, so, no, it's lies, damn lies, and statistics. But anyway, yes. <laughs> all I'm saying is that for some reason, people are in it too, and those things are going on, and the media and some politicians or somebody is making a much, I mean, I'm not in favor of people shooting each other, and it's not the Wild West, but, but, but it's an it's a inflamed rhetoric that's going on around that issue without dealing with the facts. I, but I don't see a solution. Well, so, the no answer, solution. so the answer to your question, Barb, um, is yes, there are several uh, pieces of legislation. They're starting in the House, and um, they are to repeal some of the gun uh, safety legislation that was passed last year. And I haven't read any of that. I don't know what it says. So I'm not uh, able to really comment on whether I would vote for something or not. But I do know that when we pass legislation to require background checks um, in circumstances where we weren't requiring back che background checks, in the past, we um, were told by people who were opposed to the background legislation that um, criminals wouldn't try to purchase their weapons uh, where they would, uh, where a background check would be required. But the statistics now that we're able to collect show that, and I don't mean this to be funny because there's nothing funny about shootings at all, but but they were the criminals weren't smart enough to go someplace else, so they were going someplace uh, where there was a background check, and we were immediately able to say, uh, "You, we can't sell you this gun because you have a criminal record, a violent behavior, and uh, in our opinion, because of this legislation, our opinion collectively <coughs> as a state, uh, through this uh, legislation that was passed, is uh, that it's not safe for criminals with violent records to have weapons. But then what did they do? <coughs> what acts? Well, so they then go someplace. So of, of course, yeah. of course, that's a possibility. And when the legislation was passed, there were no promises that I ever heard that there was a guarantee that we would never have another shooting. <coughs> I think that the intent was that slow we could down. reduce it, that we could slow it down that you can't guarantee it, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to prevent these shootings. And I think the other point that is, two other points that are important is, we talk about the high profile ones that are mass uh, killings, but there are so many in uh, our state and other, other states that happen every day that aren't a mass killing, but are just as heartbreaking for those families um, as far as losses. So I think it's an issue far beyond the mass killings that we talk about. 
And then the third point that I really feel strongly about and like to make in these discussions is that the seriously mentally ill are very unlikely to commit a violent crime. And the idea that we would uh, promote a myth that all we need to do is keep guns out of the hands of the seriously mentally ill is first of all, it's just not true. That's not gonna prevent these crimes from happening entirely. Um, the seriously mentally ill are more likely to be victims of crimes, statistically, than they are to commit crimes. And they are already suffering from tremendous stigmas. Mm -hmm. So to impose another stigma on top of this population that struggle with schizophrenia or uh, clinical depression or bipolar uh, conditions is just to create more grief for this particular group of people. But that's, th there's a distinction between being seriously mentally ill and having a problem managing your anger that you could say it is a mental health problem but it doesn't mean you are seriously mentally ill with a clinical diagnosis. Or you're psychotic. Yes. And you're mad. And, and, <laughs> and um, you might be scared and angry and you've lost control of your behavior because of these emotions. And so I do think that having a stronger mental health system in Colorado will help. Because when you're in a mental health crisis, you are more at risk for harming yourself, for one thing, and being able to have more resources in our state through these mental health crisis centers, I think will also help with this problem. I don't think that there is one solution. I think there are several solutions that have to be imposed on this problem to try to make a difference. I don't think it's just about the gun legislation. That's not the whole solution, of course. Um, mental health resources, I think, is part of the solution. I also think that there are some programs that we have already implemented in the state and that we need to continue to support because over time, they're going to make a huge difference, I believe, in terms of violence prevention. And those include the Nurse Family Partnership Program. And a lot of people don't even know about that program, but it's throughout Colorado. I think there are only four counties that don't have this program. And it's nurses going into the home and working with families during the prenatal period and for the first two years of life. And people say, well, how could that make any difference? But we have strong scientific evidence with these 20-year prospective studies of what happened to the children that have been in these programs in other states before it came to Colorado. And the violence prevention reduces by 79%. That's a huge reduction. And it's just helping those kids and their parents in those early years that has this enormous impact on the way they manage their anger and how they are able to cope as they get older. So there are programs like that that um, we need to continue to support. Um, and But that's not the only solution. It's just one. We need a whole toolbox to make this work. An, an illustration of how these things come together, in my mind, I just read in the paper this morning, they, they were some information about the young man who shot a, a, a student at Arapahoe High School. Mm -hmm. And there, the, there was a school where there, the, the, the report I read said that a security officer in the school saw that student sitting by himself in the cafeteria <coughs> looking at pictures of guns on his computer. And the, another related incident a few days before, the same student was extremely angry and banging on the door of a classroom of somebody, of some different person, you know, you know, making, creating a disturbance in school. Well, it does, it, you know, it, it, there's not full information on it yet, but clearly the school was not able to respond to that demonstrated, irrational anger of that student. They didn't do anything about it. And so that, that and, and, and unfortunately then it happened tragically. And that student may not have a, he may not have had a 
critical mental health right. problem, right. but obviously he was troubled, yes. irrationally angry, and, and, he, and danger mm -hmm. to himself and others. And the school wasn't set up to take care of that problem. And, and they, we could change that. Right. We could change that and make it so that the next school that faced that problem was more ready to deal with it. My understanding is that that also was true at Colorado, <laughs> that there were some early signs, some early warning signs um, that were disregarded um, by the school, um, and we might have been head off, able to head off that event as well. Um, yes? The Safe to Tell Ask, you have a, some literature here on, I think is designed, is that one of the programs designed to try to get some early information on Absolutely. someone who's potentially going to do something like that? Absolutely. School? And I, I support. I think that's that's a good that's one 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 thing in the toolbox. I mean, there are a lot of exactly. things that have to be mm -hmm. used. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we teach anger management in school as a required course? And if not, why not? Why ask? Because we only teach math and reading. <laughs> we don't teach music. We don't teach art. I think, yeah, I think you had a good. I think you had a good suggestion, which is a lot of this stuff that's going on with discussion should be taken up with the school board. It's not as yes. big an issue with what we're your students need. We have a teacher. <laughs> we need a student. <laughs> All right. Student student partnership programs is actually a very mm -hmm. yeah it's a, it's something that could, that could really help a lot of schools. Students recognizing other students that are in need. I the opposite of the opposite of bullying. Exactly. I started a, a program like that in the Gilpin School when I was a school nurse. It was a peer counseling program, and we taught youth how to watch for those signals, those those red flags, and um, where how they could reach out to those students appropriately but not take full responsibility um, and how they could help those students get connected to um, resources if a kid, you know, sometimes teenagers will tell each other things that they won't tell adults and like I'm pregnant, what should I do, you know, those kind of things and so we um, trained this whole group of students to be peer counselors and they would, they would know that you know, if somebody said I'm pregnant and I don't know what to do they should come to me because I was a school nurse. And if um, if they uh, you know had some other challenge, a mental health challenge, for example, they knew that they had met the resources, the kids that we trained met the adult resources in the community. And we built those for, um, uh, partnerships up with them, so they knew they could trust these search people to work with their friends. What happened to that program? The school board decided it was not a good program and defunded it. Jimmy, what about Medicaid in the state? What's happening with the uh, with the funding of that and the change in the Accountable Care Act and things like that? that, that are you? That doesn't the legislature allocate some of the money towards where funding goes for Medicaid? We do. That's a huge, huge mm -hmm. part of the budget, um, and a lot more people have been enrolled in Medicaid in the last few months. Um, because of Connect for Colorado, the new health exchange in Colorado. Um, if you uh, didn't have health insurance and are looking for health insurance, you can go online in Connect for Colorado and shop for health insurance. And the first step in that process is to be determined uh, to be either eligible or not eligible for Medicaid. And if you're eligible for Medicaid, you're immediately um, enrolled in the Medicaid program. If you're not eligible for Medicaid because your income is too high, then um, the, you can look and shop online for the best health insurance that would cover you. And in some cases, um, because you're using this approach to get your health insurance, you will become eligible if you're limited income, but more income than Medicaid eligibility, for um, assistance in paying for your premium. So it's kind of a three level, three tier um, insurance plan. And for that reason, we've enrolled a whole lot more people in Medicaid that didn't realize they were even eligible for Medicaid. But also, we expanded the eligibility for Medicaid. Uh, we also, not only in terms of um, the income eligibility, but also to add dental benefits that 
the Medicaid population mm -hmm. didn't have before. How is it going to be funded? I mean, how, how much of how much of Medicaid is federal uh, funds and how much are state funds? And it sounds wonderful that we're including all these new people, but how is it being paid for and who's paying for it? The, the new people that are being enrolled right now in Medicaid expansion, it's 100% federal government. This year. This year, and it phases down um, till we pay something like 85%. Uh, the federal government pays 85 percent, the state picks up 15 percent. But don't quote me on the percentage because it's about that. I can't remember the exact percentages. And it phases down over time initially. That's 100 um, percent. And the, I think the important question to ask in relationship to that is what are we paying for those people to get care right now? Because we're actually paying right now for people who don't have insurance already, those of us who have insurance for middle income people or upper income people, we're paying right now to provide care for those people through our emergency rooms, through our urgent care centers, um, all of the places that people go when they don't have coverage and they have an emergency. Do we have and, numbers on that? Yes, we do. And the numbers, and the, the, not only the numbers of people, but it's the the dollars mm -hmm. because the dollars are so much higher because for example a person with diabetes who doesn't get care early has far more uh, serious complications and expenses uh, associated with their care so for example if you were diabetic and you didn't get any primary care at all and didn't manage your diabetes early because you didn't have health care and insurance and couldn't afford out of pocket uh, and now you have to have your leg amputated um, or um, uh, kidney dialysis because of the complications or you're blind, then it's much more costly and we're paying for that also. And so it's uh, not only a way to uh, pay differently, but it's to um, keep the population healthier in general. Casey. Yeah, um, I, I don't know the, the numbers, I should know if I don't. Most of the prisoners in our county jail do not have health insurance. And we, when they have a, a health condition, they are taken to the hospital to be treated. It's a very inefficient way to be treated. We do have doctors come in too, but a lot of them go to the hospital. We're hoping more of them will have insurance going forward. So we're going to be tracking that to see what kind of cost savings the jail gets from an increased uh, prisoner insurance. It's an enormous burden on the counties uh, to pay for health care of inmates. And it's often because they didn't get any health care for a long time and to have serious heart disease that could have been managed very differently if they had had health care and gotten primary care. And now uh, all of us are paying for them for um, their heart surgery because um, it's a requirement if they're in our jails or in our penitentiaries to provide them with health care. Yeah, and their sex changes. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we're paying for their sex changes. Um, and um, um, we're, it's not just the physical um, challenges in the jails. Huge, huge population of the, of the jail population and um, correction facilities uh, are seriously mentally ill and should be treated very differently in a much more respectful way um, than we're treating them right now. It would save us a lot of money and it would save those families and those individuals a, a lot of hardship and heartache because of the way we're treating them now. It's not right. I think this expansion now with the Medicaid and, and stuff in our state, are our databases more secure than what's happening in the Affordable Care Act right now with all their problem with not being able to secure the data. Are, are, are we doing okay, okay here? We are doing so much better. Okay. I am so pleased that Colorado made the decision. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a decision that I was a part of when uh, I first uh, was in the legislature, elected to the le legislature, uh, to uh, have our own health exchange. And our health exchange is by far more successful. Um, than the national one, just because we haven't had nearly as many glitches. But the data is set. The data is much more. The data is much more secure. Yeah, 
Um, I just attended last week a briefing on the health exchange in Colorado to learn about how is it going, what were some of the problems that we found when we rolled it out, how they've those been solved. They were not security breaches, but they were um, um, situations where when people applied, it took them an unbelievably long time. Uh, and we, we realized that we were sending them to screens that they didn't need to uh, even look at, let alone um, enter data into. And it was like, oh, you know, we've got to be able to fix it. We get to the moon and figure out that, you know, that's, that's easily solved. So now the time is much better. And the other thing that uh, I saw when I looked at the data um, and heard the report was how many of the population of very young people are signing up. Because we were really worried that the young population, the young invincibles who don't think that, that they really even need health insurance, we thought they weren't going to sign up. But actually, a lot of them are signing up. It was about a third, a third, a third in the population breakdowns, you know, between the age groups. Um, so it was like, phew. And we thought this was going to be a major problem. But those, those very young people that, um, uh, you know, like uh, in the age group between 26 and 36, so they're not on their parents' programs or insurance plans anymore, that kind of thing. We thought those people were going to sign up, but they are. So they're not Medicaid people? No, they're not Medicaid. Is that typical in the country or just Colorado? I think that Colorado is doing better. When you say signing up, are we having the same back end issues that the Affordable CP. Care Act is having? And that is people following through and actually getting their insurance policy in effect? You know, getting. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. No, we're not having the same problem. Okay, so are, are the people the third that you said that they're younger? Are, are most of those now under a policy, or are they still waiting to be I'm not sure covered. exactly where they are in the phase, every one of them, but I think that we're getting them enrolled quickly, and it's much better than the federal program is. Um, and I, um, I know that there is another whole group of people who know that they've got a little bit more time, and so they're dragging their feet, the young invincibles. And so some of them haven't signed up, but a lot of them are coming and uh, checking in online. And we can tell that they're checking in online. Not in, we don't know the individual information because it's just aggregate data that we see. But we know that um, they're checking in and trying to find out what's available. And then they're going to sign up at the last minute. Yeah. But I, I'm just pleased that that they're even paying attention because I was afraid we were going to have to go, you know, we need you guys to sign up. Something could happen to you too. You guys are at risk for a lot of injuries in that age group. So, so it's uh, four o'clock. One more question. If I, could, I, if I could just do an unsolicited plug for Jeannie. Um, I last, the last two days in Colorado County is where all the county commissioners get together and talk about legislation and we discuss what legislation we're going to support, what legislation we have concerns about. And I'll let you know that Jeannie, probably your background as a county commissioner made a big difference. But she actually came to Colorado counties and talked about her bill that had to do with uh, helping with child care and asked the counties, because we administer the program. The, the legislature passes the law, but then when it comes time to actually manage the, uh, the program, the counties have to do it. Jeannie came to the counties and said, here's what we want to do, what do you guys think? And I've got to say that uh, you were the only legislator, you and, and, and uh, Brittany were the only <coughs> legislators that came and, and asked us as a body what we thought. And so thank you very much for doing that. I think it makes a big difference. You're welcome. And so uh, I think that bill is going to be successful in no small part because you're collaborative in how you do your work. Yeah, thank you. And I want to say thank you for doing this. Yes. You're, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. Thanks.